Of course, iron is not just necessary for the developing brain, but also the function of the adult brain. And one of the main mechanisms for this relates to the production of chemicals in the brain called neurotransmitters. And iron is a necessary cofactor for the action of two enzymes, tyrosine hydroxylase and tryptophan hydroxylase that are responsible for the production of dopamine and serotonin, respectively. This means in an iron deficient state, the brain is going to be deficient in both dopamine and serotonin. This was confirmed by this study, a randomized trial of women aged between 18 and 35. So first of all, at baseline, study subjects with iron deficiency were both slower at and performed worse on cognitive tests. And when iron levels were restored, improvements in cognitive function were five to seven times greater compared with those subjects who didn't have an improvement in iron levels. So with this knowledge, it's fair to say no parent would ever knowingly deny their child a diet with adequate iron. And so they might turn to Google to find foods rich in iron to feed their children. The same Google which curates, some would say censors, health-related search results in line with its partnership with the World Health Organization. Hence, the top result for my search for foods good in iron were plant foods, with no mention of meat anywhere. This is an absurdity. You see, iron comes in two forms, heme and non-heme. The heme form is by far the most bioavailable, and it's only found in meat or seafood. The iron in plant foods like spinach, on the other hand, is entirely non-heme. And in fact, the absorption of iron from spinach is somewhere in the range of 2 to 12%. And despite claims to the contrary, it's unlikely that vitamin C is going to rescue you. A recent randomised control trial, these pesky bits of research again, found that vitamin C offered no benefit in improving the absorption rate of non-heme iron. And it's not just spinach that has poor iron absorption. This paper found the bioavailability of iron from five commonly consumed legumes was in the range of one to two percent. And the low bioavailability of iron from plant foods is no doubt a major contributor to the rate of iron deficiencies in vegans and vegetarians, which is three to four times greater than the population average. To promote plant foods as a good source of iron is borderline criminal, if for no other reason than iron deficiency is the world's most common nutrient deficiency, affecting about two billion people. Of course, iron is not the only nutrient that's more bioavailable in animal foods. The animal form of vitamin A is 12 times more bioavailable than its plant-based counterpart, meaning you need to take 12 times as much beta carotene compared to retinol, which is found in animals. Another nutrient that's far more bioavailable in animals is vitamin D3, which is two to three times more effective at raising vitamin D stores than the plant-based version, vitamin D2. And it isn't just that plant foods lack nutrients or that the nutrients they have are in inferior forms. Plants also contain other factors that inhibit nutrient absorption, and these are called anti-nutrients. This includes tannins, phytates, oxalates, glucosinolates, saponins, and protease inhibitors. This means that even when a plant food does contain a nutrient, the absorption of that nutrient may well be impaired. For example, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and kale contain glucosinolates, sulfur-containing compounds which impair the absorption of iodine, which may impact on thyroid function. Oxalates found in leafy greens and nuts, amongst others, can bind to calcium, not only limiting calcium absorption, but being a major cause of kidney stones. Phytates found in whole grains and seeds, amongst others, limits the absorption of iron, zinc, magnesium, and calcium. While the tannins in tea, including green tea, can limit the absorption of iron. So let's have a look and see what the magnitude of this effect on nutrient absorption might actually be. 
So this graph, courtesy of Dr. Georgia E, demonstrates the normal level of zinc in the circulation after a meal of oysters. See the impact of combining the same meal of oysters with black beans, which like most legumes contain several anti-nutrients? The peak level of zinc in the blood is reduced by more than two thirds. That still is not as dramatic as the impact of corn tortillas which like other grains also contain several anti-nutrients. You can see the addition of corn to tears to oysters completely blocks the absorption of zinc. So how much nutrition from tacos do you really think you're gonna be getting? Of course, there is a counterclaim that animal foods are deficient in vitamin C. And if you were looking through the USDA nutrient data for beef, this is exactly what you'd see. The thing is, vitamin C levels weren't actually measured when they formulated this data. Rather, the widespread practice of assumption was employed. That is, it was assumed that the level of vitamin C in meat was zero, and it was simply recorded as such without actually measuring it. When it's actually tested, however, we actually find that meat actually does contain vitamin C which is no doubt what we would have predicted if those working in the USDA were students of history. Throughout history, entire populations have been sustained on meat-based diets. Let's hear from Arctic explorer, William Moore Stefansson, who lived with the Inuit for a prolonged period. Well, now this raises the whole question of, uh, of food then. Um, surely, surely there's, there's some uh, you yourself must have longed for a green vegetable once in a while. Well, I did it first. Uh, I, um, my first experience was that a ship that was supposed to meet me didn't meet me. Mm -hmm. And I had to become a guest of the Eskimos. And for four and a half months, I lived on literally nothing but fish and water. Well, we had some uh, blubber, some uh, polar bear blubber, but apart mm -hmm. from that. And at the end of four and a half months, I was healthier than I'd never been before. Likewise. At the bottom of the world in Antarctica, meat has long been used to treat scurvy. Indeed, there was complete recovery from an outbreak of scurvy during Robert Scott's 1902 expedition with the consumption of lightly fried seal meat and liver. Indeed, Scott's journal entry from the 15th of October in that year reported, within a fortnight of the outbreak, there is scarcely a sign of it remaining. Heald's is the only case that hung at all, and he is now able to get about once more. Cross's recovery was so rapid, he was able to join the seal killing party last week. And even before Antarctica was discovered, the use of meat for scurvy was known. In fact, Napoleon's army used cooked horse meat during the 1801 siege of Alexandria to effectively curb an epidemic of scurvy. So no, Eating too much meat won't, in fact, cause scurvy. I'd like to now shift gears and address one of the most common arguments I hear against eating meat, that we are not evolved to eat meat. Remember, though, that B12 is essential for life and that B12 was only synthesised in the lab in 1972. Of course, there is an alternative explanation that has been put forward, and I promise I'm not making this up. It's claimed that pre-agriculture humans would have drive their B12 through, and I quote, accidental ingestion of soil and manure. Mm. Do I really need to scientifically critique that claim? Some vegan activists will also use scientific looking tables like this one on comparative anatomy. The problem is they're full of blatant falsehoods. For example, the assertion that omnivores do not have digestive enzymes in their saliva is clearly false when we look at the research. The claim that humans don't have a very acidic stomach is also the stuff of fairy tales. This claim is made in the context that an acidic gut is useful for digesting meat. The fact is, however, that the human gut is even more acidic than that of dogs. And there's also a big difference in the volume of the colon between the herbivorous great apes, in which it represents about 50% of the volume of the gastrointestinal tract, compared to only 20% in humans. 
And I should also mention that even the so-called herbivorous great apes won't pass up the chance of a nutrient-dense meal if they can get one. The fact is, there is no credible science that indicates humans are not designed to eat red meat. Now, let's examine the claim that vegan diets are good for animals. Mice love grain, something farmers know only too well. But when you combine a voracious appetite and prolific breeding, you'll understand why they're abundant in every single field of grain the world over. It's estimated that the typical grain field houses about 25 mice per hectare in non-plague years. The problem is, harvesters don't discriminate between mice or wheat. Any mouse found in a field is at risk of meeting a gruesome death. Of course, it's often claimed that there's no way an agile mice would remain in the path of a noisy harvester. It's well known, though, that a common response to fear by mice is freezing. And this Nature paper even detailed the brain circuitry involved in such a response in mice. So based on field studies, it's estimated that about 60% of mice in the path of a harvester perish. Given there are about 25 mice per hectare, this equates to the deaths of about 15 mice per hectare per harvest. And this ignores the deaths of other species, as well as deaths that result from the use of other heavy machinery, such as ploughing, harrowing, and cultivating. On the balance of probabilities, 15 deaths per hectare is a gross underestimate. Even more stark, however, is that machinery only accounts for a fraction of mice deaths. I'll say that again. The proven deaths of rodents by machinery is not the major cause of death. That honour goes to poisons yielded by farmers, especially in plague years, which tend to occur every four years or so. Population densities in a plague can reach up to 3,000 mice per hectare, with poisons employed capable of killing at least 80% of mice present. The fact is, a lot of lives a loss to make your bread, whether you like it or not. Ignorance here is really no excuse. I'd like to now discuss the environmental catastrophe that is monocropping. This is nature in all her glory, a wild meadow, complete ecosystem supported by pollinated insects and animals. It's soil that filters the water and acts as a vast carbon sink. And this is a monocrop where the diversity of life has been all but destroyed. The major issue is soil. Every time soil is ploughed, it is depleted. Trillions of organisms are exposed to the sun with wind and rain free to wash soil away. Combine this with the liberal use of pesticides, which alter the microbial communities essential for releasing nutrients within the soil, and you ultimately end up with a pile of dirt in which nothing can grow. It's no exaggeration to say this is the biggest environmental catastrophe of our time that we are ignoring. Consider this. About one third of the world's productive topsoil has already been depleted. And last year, a UN report predicted that based on our current trajectory, 90% of the world's topsoil will be depleted by 2050, less than 30 years from now. Given that 95% of the world's calorie intake depends on soil, this is an impending disaster the likes of which we've never seen. And the cause is clear industrial farming techniques used in monocrop agriculture. Intensive tilling and the intensive use of pesticides and fertilisers. In line with the degradation in soil quality, fruits and vegetables have had significant declines in their nutrient quality over the last 50 years. Without healthy soil, we don't get healthy food. Here you can see the average change in nutrient levels for 13 nutrients from 43 garden crops between 1950 and 1999. And have no doubt, 24 years later, after this data was collected, the picture is almost certainly worse. Unlike industrial farming, however, ruminant grazing can actually restore topsoil. Perennial grasses are essential for soil regeneration. First of all, 
they bind the soil together, protecting against erosion from wind and rain. Further, as the roots grow and die off, they decompose and contribute to the biomass of the soil while removing carbon from the atmosphere in the process. In actual fact, soil currently holds three times more carbon than that in the atmosphere. Cow manure too contributes to soil biomass, significantly contributing to soil quality. So we have a choice, industrial monocrop agriculture, which within our lifetime could see widespread famine, or ruminant agriculture, which can restore soil and sequester carbon. Let's now address one of the most common arguments against livestock farming, that it requires excessive use of agricultural land. The United Nations estimates livestock farming uses 77% of the world's agricultural land. It sounds huge. This figure implies that cows are monopolising agricultural land. The argument being that if we could only grow crops on this land, more food could be produced. See this here? This rich agricultural land is currently used for livestock. Can you guess why? Good luck getting a combine harvester up those hills. This is called marginal agricultural land, so named because it is unsuitable for cropping. And worldwide, two thirds of all agricultural land is designated marginal, completely unsuitable for cropping. If it weren't used for grazing, it wouldn't produce any food at all. Here's a map of the agricultural lands in Australia. See all those areas in gray, basically desert, completely unsuitable for cropping. If these lands weren't grazed, they'd be completely unproductive. So the claim that we could produce far more food if we simply grew crops on agricultural land used by livestock is questionable at best. Furthermore, there's no truth to the claims that the land used by livestock is increasing. The fact is there hasn't been any significant increases in the amount of land used for livestock since the 1960s. And as well as monopolising land, it's often claimed that livestock deplete our precious freshwater reserves, known as blue water. The fact is, though, over 90% of the water consumed by livestock is what we call green water, basically rainwater in its natural cycle. This water was never going to form part of our freshwater reserves. This green water remains in its natural cycle regardless if it passes through a cow or not. This is not wasted water. In reality, far more blue water or freshwater reserve is dedicated to watering crops, 70% in fact. Now monocrop agriculture depends on vast quantities of pesticides which indiscriminately kill flora and insects alike. What surprised me however, and not in a good way, was the scale of pesticide use. The y-axis of this graph shows the agricultural use of glyphosate measured in millions of pounds. Now understand that as weeds become resistant to pesticides, farmers respond by using more pesticides, a similar story to antibiotic resistant. But I was genuinely shocked to read this United Nations report which detailed that in 2020, more than two billion kilograms of pesticide were used around the world. In fact, over the last 30 years, annual pesticide use has averaged about 0.37 kilograms or 0.8 pounds for every single person every year. And 70% of that was applied in just the last 10 years. Doing the sums, if you're 30 years old, your share of pesticide application is more than 11 kilograms or 24 pounds. Let that sink in. Of course, this huge number is understandable when you realise how indiscriminately pesticides are used. This glyphosate product, for example, has been approved for application to wheat crops six days before harvest. Think about that. Do you really want your grains to have been sprayed with Roundup less than a week before harvest? Understand too that glyphosate accumulates in grains and cannot be removed by washing or broken down by cooking. Once it's there, it's there to stay. 
This is why Food Standards Australia and New Zealand was able to find glyphosate in several different types of bread, biscuits, crackers and cereals, including infant rice cereal. A further concern to mothers is that glyphosates have also been found in breast milk. Now, one interesting area of research currently being pursued is examining the impacts of glyphosate-induced altered gut microbial populations on young children. Basically, Clostridium botulinum, a highly pathogenic bacterium capable of releasing a potent toxin, is highly resistant to glyphosate which basically means glyphosate exposure can increase its abundance. And my understanding is that this bacterium has been associated with sudden infant death syndrome in at least two studies. With the paucity of further research to investigate this being somewhat puzzling. And before you carnivores out there get too smug, understand this potentially impacts you too. It's not an uncommon practice to feed cattle on cover crops that have been sprayed with pesticides, both to prepare a field for cropping and to save on animal feed. And this 2018 study assessed for the presence of glyphosates in various organs and tissues of cattle. Concerningly, glyphosates seem to be fairly evenly distributed throughout the animals, though this was noticeably lower in cattle fed with organic feed. And this potentially has implications for whether or not you consume cattle raised in feedlots, being fed crops, adulterated with pesticides, or whether you choose grass-fed and finished cattle. As an obvious aside, consuming the grass-raised cattle is also going to be clearly better for the environment. This study also has some significant findings for vegans too. The level of glyphosate measured in the urine was significantly lower in humans consuming predominantly organic foods. And further, chronic illness was associated with significantly higher levels of urine glyphosates. And while this isn't proof of cause, in my mind, it certainly merits further research. In closing, Nutrients from animal foods clearly offer benefit in terms of intelligence over unsupplemented vegan diets which lack key nutrients required to sustain both body and mind. Secondly, we must be mindful of poor quality research, the findings often being presented as conclusive when this is far from the case. We ought to be wary of the many unsubstantiated claims demonizing red meat, such as it lacking vitamin C, or causing bowel cancer, while also being aware of the environmental consequences of modern industrial agriculture. Finally, understand there is no such thing as a diet for which nothing has died. <laughs>